Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless just when you thought no one could damage their own brand more than bud light whose sales have plunged by 21 percent since arranging for trans woman dylan mulvaney to promote their product the u.s navy has said hold my beer the Navy has appointed a drag queen to be the face of an online recruitment drive in a bid to encourage reluctant young men to join up. Yeoman second class Joshua Kelly, who identifies as non-binary and goes by the stage name Harpy Daniels, has been acting as the Navy's digital ambassador. Advertising themselves as sailor by day, drag queen by night, Kelly says they are proud to serve, proud to slay. I'm certain Xi Jinping is shaking in his heels. Sorry, boots. Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, told the House Armed Services Committee last month that the Navy is projected to fall 6,000 recruits, or 16%, short of its goal for enlisted sailors this fiscal year. So, they're exploring new recruitment strategies, such as this one. We reached the moon, but lost in space, I think we got there all too soon. I'm coming back for you, baby. And if that doesn't convince young men to join the Navy, there's this. Yo, la, 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 this throat lady. Boy, say hallelujah. Give me that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Meanwhile, Iran has seized a second US bound oil tanker in a week, and the Chinese Communist Party has unveiled its newest aircraft carrier that claims to be able to carry more aircraft with more munitions flying on longer missions. All of which raises the big question, can the West's obsession with woke survive a full-blown war? Or will Chinese missiles soon explode the never-never land of unreality in which we've all been living? No wonder the Pentagon hesitated to shoot down that Chinese spy balloon. It was probably too busy scheduling the next equity and gender training session for American service members. Seriously, folks, why are you surprised? Weakness is a consequence of a woke U.S. military. Here's one example. It's a shortened clip from a recent U.S. Army recruitment video. It reveals a lot about the U.S. military's shocking transformation. It begins in California with a little girl raised by two moms. I also marched for equality. I like to think I've been defending freedom from an early age. When I was six years old, one of my moms had an accident that left her paralyzed but she tapped into my family's pride to get back on her feet. Eventually standing at the altar to marry my other mom. And after meeting with an army recruiter, I found it. A way to prove my inner strength. I'm US Army Corporal Emma Malone Lord, and I answered my calling. Folks, is this the military's calling? Animated recruitment videos promoting lesbianism and same-sex marriage? In all fairness, this is only the most recent of many U.S. Army recruitment videos, but truly it appears the Pentagon is more concerned about advancing woke ideas, like what pronouns someone is using, rather than recruiting tough, masculine men to defend our nation. Now compare that recruitment clip to this one from China's People's Liberation Army. Remember, this is the same army that just sent that spy balloon unhindered over its sensitive U.S. military bases. Quite the contrast. No wonder U.S. recruitment hit its lowest level since the draft ended in 1973. It was down about 25% for the fiscal year 2022. Many in our culture want young men to become kinder, gentler, and more feminine. But that doesn't work for the military. Most 18 to 20 year old men would be more likely to sign up if the Army placed greater emphasis on training and equipping troops to overcome the nation's enemies rather than teaching them to embrace their preferred pronouns and transgenderism. Folks, it's time the Pentagon stopped this nonsense. 
From our nation's origins in 1789 until 1947, the Defense Department was called the War Department, and for good reason. Its main task is to defend this nation and win wars, period. Our founding fathers never intended our military leaders to be social engineers. So let's get back to advancing the idea of warriors wanted and army strong before it's too late. You may have heard the phrase, God's hand of protection. It seems that it is something God would do, keep a person or nation in the shelter of his hand. But what happens to a nation when it decides to disobey God's laws? In America's case, it's not that God has lifted his hand of protection. It's that America has left God's hand of protection. And as a result, it seems as though he has forgotten our children. Hosea 4.6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. America claims to be a Christian nation, with 70% of the people claiming such. But in reality, the true number of Christians are far less. This nation has made a God of their own liking. A God who accepts abortion. A God who accepts homosexuality. A God who accepts fornication. If you're having sex, and you're not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. A God who accepts sexual immorality. This is not the true God of the Bible. This comes from the God of this world, who has been given power for a short time, aka Satan. The God of the Bible tells us, he hates hands that shed innocent blood, Proverbs 6.17. He calls homosexuality an abomination, Leviticus 18.22. He tells us sex is between a man and a woman in marriage, Genesis 2.24. The God of the Bible tells us the sin of abortion, homosexuality, fornication, and all sexual immorality, if not forgiven and repented of, sends a person to hell, as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments and give him the glory that only he deserves. He has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America, and the result is a society full of evil doers. When we are choosing to hold on to sin, rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers, as we read in Isaiah 1.15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law, make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30, 12 says, For thus says the Lord, your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Almost everything in this world has been perverted. The truth is being turned into lies and lies into the truth. 
Nothing seems to make sense anymore, at least to a righteous person, those that believe in Jesus Christ. Can you be both a serious Christian and a public school teacher at the same time? Well, in Riverside, California, the answer is no, according to my next guest and former phys ed teacher, who was fired earlier this year after she said she refused to lie to parents about their children's gender identities and wouldn't use students' preferred pronouns. Now, as a Christian, Jessica Tapia says doing so would have violated her religious liberty, and she's now suing. Jessica joins me now, along with her attorney, Mariah Gondiero. Jessica, you asked for a religious accommodation, which you say was denied. Now, what exactly did the district want you to do if a parent asked you about what was going on with uh, his or her child's gender identity? Right. So interestingly enough, I didn't even ask for a religious accommodation. What had happened was, is I was presented with directives that I chose to speak out about and say, I, I won't comply with these. They're against my beliefs. The three directives that I spoke out about, one was calling students by their preferred gender or pronoun, um, withholding that information from parents, which I, I clarified, are you asking me to lie to parents? And to which they said, yes, it's for student privacy and it's the law. And then the third one was that I had to let transgender students into the female locker room, again, to which I clarified, are you, are you referring to biological males? And, and they said, yes, if, if that individual is, is presenting like and choosing to be female now, you need to let them in as a believer. But I also believe as just a person of, of moral and knowing right from wrong, um, I, was, I was not willing to comply with these directives. And so I let the district know I'm, I'm ready to, to come back to work, do the job I've always done, but I will not comply with these three things. And that is when they said, it sounds like you're asking for a religious accommodation because I described to them why these things were against my beliefs. We reached out to the school district who gave us a comment saying the Jerupa Unified School District denies Ms. Tapia's reported allegations were committed to providing all students and staff with a discrimination and harassment free learning environment and respect the religious beliefs of its students and staff. Mariah, was your client's religious beliefs, were they respected here? Absolutely not. This is a clear case of religious discrimination. They chose to retaliate against Ms. Tapia because she would not go along with her district's woke ideology regarding gender identity, while at the same time allowing other teachers to express their beliefs on social media and in, in the classroom. And they claim that Ms. Tapia was violating federal law and, and state law because her, her language and her speech was harassing and discriminatory. But actually, if you look at her record, her her students have actually loved her and adored her. Her previous reviews have showed that she is a distinguished teacher. So this is simply religious discrimination. Well, they actually think, Jessica, very quickly, they actually have deemed Christianity, practiced by millions of people across the country, and serious Christians, as discriminatory. Right? That's what they're actually saying. If you're a serious Christian, you are guilty of discriminating if you actually live up to your beliefs. That's what they're saying here. It, it certainly feels that way. Um, it, the truth is dangerous in today's day and age, right? We're living in a day and age filled with mm -hmm. lies, and the lies specifically are after the children. Is there such a thing as absolute truth? The unsaved hold the view there is no right or wrong. Therefore, whatever feels or seems right at the time and in that situation is right. Christians hold the view that there are indeed absolute realities and standards that define what is true and what is not. To the unsaved, tolerance has become the one cardinal virtue of the postmodern society, the one absolute, and therefore, intolerance is the only evil. Any dogmatic belief, especially a belief in absolute truth, is viewed as intolerance, the ultimate sin to an unbeliever. If there is absolute truth, then there are absolute standards of right and wrong and we are accountable to those standards. This accountability is what people are really rejecting when they reject absolute truth. The denial of absolute truth and the cultural relativism that comes with it are the logical result of a society 
that has embraced the theory of evolution as the explanation for life. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning, we have no purpose, and there cannot be any absolute right or wrong. Man is then free to live as he pleases and is accountable to no one for his actions. Yet, no matter how much sinful men deny the existence of God and absolute truth, they still will someday stand before God in judgment. The Bible declares this in Romans 1, 19-22, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Is there any evidence for the existence of absolute truth? Yes, there is the human conscience, that certain something within us that tells us the world should be a certain way, that some things are right and some things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us there is something wrong with suffering, pain, and evil, and it makes us aware that love, generosity, compassion, and peace are positive things for which we should strive. The Bible describes the role of the human conscience as we read in Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his Son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. Luke 21-25 And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Soldiers from the Army Signal Corps in North Khartoum. So far, I've hunted down three enemy vehicles, circulate this on social media. God is the greatest. There's been intense fighting in this area and in Khartoum, despite a seven-day ceasefire, and in the city of al in North Kurdufan state. Elsewhere in the capital, a militarized police unit exchanges fire with the rapid support forces. The army, led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, has ruled out negotiations. The government of Sudan has agreed only to the ceasefire and not to any mediation regarding the resolution of the conflict. This is simply because it is a rebellion against the Sudanese armed forces by a group once affiliated to the army. To us, the final solution will be decided on the ground. Prior to the conflict, 15 million people were reliant on humanitarian assistance for survival. That number has now increased, with tens of thousands displaced and aid meant for those in need looted or destroyed. And here in Khartoum, people have been trapped for days with no power or running water, and in some parts, unable to even buy food to sustain themselves. Sudan is rich in natural resources, but despite this, the UN classifies it as a low-income country and says it cannot cope with the unfolding humanitarian crisis. The fighting needs to stop, and to stop now. Before more people die, and this conflict explodes into an all-out war that could affect the region for years to come. The fate of millions of Sudanese is in the hands of two men, locked in a power struggle, refusing to lay down their weapons and negotiate. Scenes of destruction in India's northeastern Manipur state. 
Long running tensions between the majority Meitei community and tribal groups has flared into violence. The unrest was triggered by a court ruling recommending that the Meitei should be labeled a scheduled tribe, which would grant special job quotas and subsidized education. Other tribal groups are opposed to this. The Indian Army has been called in to restore calm. Thousands of people have also been moved to safer locations. Mobile internet has been shut down for five days and the state government has issued a shoot at sight order to enforce a curfew. India's army says it's brought the situation under control and is continuing to work to restore normalcy. Tonight, the ancient city of Nablus echoing with gunfire. Israeli special forces cornering and killing three Hamas militants after a month-long pursuit across the occupied West Bank. The gunman responsible for killing a British Israeli mother and her two daughters, according to both Hamas and Israel. At a nearby refugee camp, a hasty funeral for the slain militants, hailed by many as martyrs for their cause. These Hamas fighters were killed just a couple of hours ago, but their bodies are already being paraded through the streets and their armed comrades are calling for revenge. Hundreds of Palestinians from different factions turning out to honor them, including this 19-year-old. If the Israelis won't allow us into the occupied lands, we won't allow them to come here to the West Bank, he says. Last month, another funeral, but a very different scene. Lucy D. and her daughters Maya and Rina killed by the Hamas gunman in an ambush. The family, originally from London, moved to a West Bank settlement, their father delivering the eulogy for his own children. But tonight, feeling some measure of justice. We were uh, tremendously comforted by the uh, thought that they were uh, apprehended and eliminated and um, that everybody in the Western world can effectively sleep safer in their beds tonight. Violence in the Holy Land intensifying since an Israeli police raid on Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque, Islam's third holiest site. Police say they were clearing out extremists, Palestinians calling it unprovoked violence. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu meeting members of Congress today, saying his forces worked night and day to track the gunman. Palestinians say these are Israeli undercover agents entering Nablus in disguise. NBC News has not been able to independently verify who these people are. And Israeli police told us they could not disclose specific operational details. The gunman tracked to this abandoned house and killed in a shootout. This whole area is covered in shell casings like this left behind from the firefight. Hours after the raid in Nablus, Israel's military says a Palestinian woman stabbed a soldier in a nearby town. She was killed at the scene. One more death in a year with too many of them. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24:12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3-4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. After an all-night manhunt involving helicopters and hundreds of police officers, a suspect was arrested in Kragujevic, a hundred kilometers south of Belgrade. Local media report a gunman opened fire from a moving vehicle at passers-by in three villages just 60 kilometers from the capital, killing and injuring villagers. Serbia's interior minister has called the shootings a terrorist act, and many residents are in shock. This is terrible for our state. This is a huge defeat, unfortunately. In two days, so many kids killed. This is not good. I don't know what to say. I'm shocked. 
My daughter's taking sedatives. We couldn't sleep all night. This is the second mass killing in the Balkan nation in two days. On Wednesday, a 13-year-old boy shot dead eight of his classmates and a security guard with his father's guns. Serbia has a widespread gun culture, a result of weapons left behind from the wars in the 90s. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 13. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jans and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further for their folly will be made manifest to all, as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I believe God has raised up Joe Biden for such a time as this. I believe God is using Joe Biden as judgment on the United States of America. Since Biden took office, every kind of evil has run amok. God will use anyone he chooses to fulfill his purpose. And I believe that purpose for Joe Biden is the destruction of America. A fascinating survey released last week got very little attention, but given the latest news out of crime-ridden New York, it's worth revisiting. According to this CBS YouGov poll, 72% of Americans think the country is out of control. The reasons they think it's out of control range from the overall state of politics at 88% to the economy at 85%, with 75% citing culture and values, and 71% just plain Biden. We showed you last night how criminals are terrorizing residents, even in San Francisco's upscale neighborhoods. I can say in my experience, and in the experience of people that I, I know and talk to, it's clearly getting worse. If you go to like a Walgreens, there's like security guards at the front trying to prevent people from stealing like basic necessities. I'm originally from Miami, actually. Oh, Miami, that's where everyone's going. <laughs> that's where I'm going back next are, month. Are, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> are you returning yes, home? Yes, Everybody's just, as soon as they graduate, they go because this is not a good place to be. And in New York, under Adams, Bragg and Hochul, all liberals, of course, it's the same story. Things are circling down the drain fast. Subway crime grew 30% last year compared to 2021, and extended lockdowns destroyed kids' education and in-office work. The Floyd riots, uh, where looting and destruction went unpunished, the continuing racial animosity stoked by the left, all of it is a factor in here. It's a powder keg with a fuse on top. Things are so bad, many residents are afraid to take the subway or even walk at night. Well, I almost got attacked by a homeless man a couple of days ago. So. Yeah, I'm much more aware of what's going on around me. I don't take the subway as much. It just gets worse every day. I do worry about the crime and the homelessness and people being pushed on the subway. It's really dangerous. Eventually, when the government cannot guarantee basic public safety, well, citizens are left to fend for themselves. They're going to refuse to be sitting ducks, which is what one Marine veteran did, in the face of a belligerent man on a moving subway car. The passenger subdued the threatening individual, a man named Jordan Neely. He kept him down with a chokehold. You can see it here. Once police arrived, he was taken to the hospital where he died. 
This individual had a rap sheet a mile long. 42 arrests, including charges stemming from three unprovoked assaults on women in the subway. He even reportedly had one active warrant for an alleged assault that happened in 2021. His death was tragic, but it sent all the pro-criminal left-wing loons out there seething. This seems to me like it's an open door to vigilantism against people who are already vulnerable. He's an ex-Marine who is trained to kill. We have to hold this individual accountable. There have to be consequences, and so we'll see how this unfolds, but uh, his family deserves justice. Alvin Bragg's office is promising a full investigation. Al Sharpton is hoping for a manslaughter charge and stands with protesters who are demanding justice for Jordan. Now, what about justice for the thousands and thousands of New Yorkers who felt threatened over the past year by the city's rampant crime? Remember the story of Jose Alba, that Harlem bodega owner, who also refused to be a victim? In self-defense, he stabbed a man who ran behind, jumped over the store counter, and shoved him up against the wall. He was initially charged with second-degree murder. Now, last July, Bragg dismissed the charges only after a loud and sustained public outcry. But there's no justice for them in Bragg's revolving door of arrests and releases, because thugs feel invincible in the Big Apple. They have an upper hand on the streets and underground. Like subway slasher Alvin Charles in 2021, after allegedly stabbing a 36-year-old teacher in the arm and stomach, he was freed on supervised release by a liberal judge. Then last fall, he was arrested for stabbing Tommy Bailey, a father of three, to death on the subway. Bailey fought back, but it was too late. Now think about the culture we're creating here, where men who jump in and defend the defenseless are villainized, and criminals are coddled, they're deified, like George Floyd and Jordan Neely. The incentive today is when you see someone who appears dangerous, do nothing. Take no action other than maybe calling 911. But what happens when you're in an enclosed space and you have no idea when security will actually get there? Now, we don't know all the facts of this subway case yet, but we do know this. Jordan Neely shouldn't have been on the streets at all. And the presumption should be that a man or a woman who is operating in good faith when he steps in to defend himself or others from a menacing criminal. But the way the media are covering this case, you'd think the hero is the career criminal and the 24-year-old former Marine is the thug. And the inhumanity of it, you know, watching what happened with this poor person in the subway car, Jordan Neely in New York, chokehold and murdered, basically. To say murder means that Neely's death was an intentional act. Now, that's absurd on its face. Individuals who feel justifiably threatened should be able to defend themselves with proportional force. Well, here's the bottom line. New York City, San Francisco, Chicago, DC, these places are the absolute hearts of American liberalism. And if liberalism can't work there, in any of those places, some of the richest places on the planet, then it can't work anywhere because the streets aren't safe, the offices are sitting empty, the schools are failing, and normal people are trying to get away. So how can we be a great country when our biggest and richest cities are dying? Psalm 1, 1 through 6, tells us the way of the righteous in the end of the ungodly. Psalm 1, 1 through 6, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.